Uh, after it was all over, I would leave my patient on the table and I would go over to the suction bottle and I would take the little stockinette out. I'd go outside the room to a sink where I'd open this stockinette up and I personally would pick through it with the forceps and I would have to identify, you know, four extremities and a spine and a skull and the placenta. If I didn't find that, I would have to go back in that room and scrape and suction some more or else my patients would be showing up in 48, 72 hours just like those women at Cook County with an infected, incomplete abortion. And standing at that sink, I guess I just started seeing these bodies for the first time. Uh, I don't know what I did before that. I think I just counted. Uh, I was cool, you know, blood didn't make me sick. I, I could handle all the guts and gore of medicine just fine. Uh, but I started seeing this for the first time and it started bothering me. I remember one afternoon in particular, the young woman who, a very attractive young woman who was the uh, manager, the day-to-day -day manager of the clinic, uh, came up to the sink one day while I was uh, getting ready to go through my little procedure and she said, would you let me see, I've never really seen what y'all look at at the sink. And I said, sure. And I started showing her and this happened to be uh, uh, about a 12-week abortion. And that was about the, about the farthest along we went. And that day, as I was showing her, I remember, I remember very clearly seeing an arm and seeing the deltoid muscle. Uh, and just, it just really struck me that day how beautiful that was. And the thought just flashed through my mind, what are you doing? Uh, you know, here is this beautiful <laughs> piece of... of uh, of humanity, human flesh here, what are you doing? And that, that was one of the very last ones that I did. And I can remember that day watching the first abortion with the resident doctor sitting down and putting the tube in and removing the contents. And I saw the bloody material coming down the plastic tube and it went into a big jar. The first one, I'd never seen one before. I didn't know what to expect. Well, it was my job afterwards to go and undo the jar and see what was inside. Well, it was kind of neat, you know, learning about a new experience. I wasn't a Christian. I, I didn't have any views on abortion. I was in a training program. This was a brand new experience. Going to get to see a new procedure and learn. And that was exciting. And it got more exciting as I opened the jar and took the little piece of stockinette, stocking, and open that little bag and the resident doctor said now put it on that blue towel and check it out we want to make sure that we got it all and I thought oh that'll be exciting hands-on experience looking at tissue and I opened the sock up and I put it on the towel and there were parts in there of a of a person I'd taken anatomy, I was a medical student, I knew what I was looking at. There was a little scapula and an arm and I saw some ribs and a chest and I saw a little tiny head and I saw a piece of a leg and I saw a tiny hand and I saw an arm and, and you know it was like somebody put a hot poker into me. I believe that God gives us all a conscience and I wasn't a Christian but I had a conscience and that hurt. So I checked it out and there were two arms and two legs and one head and so forth and I turned and said, I guess you got it all. And that was a, a very hard experience for me to go through emotionally. If I'd been a Christian against abortion, it would have been simple. I wouldn't have been there. And if I'd been excited and wanted to do them, and excited about the money that I may make later in practice, I would have been on the opposite end. But here I was with no real convictions, caught in the middle. And so I did what a lot of us do throughout our life. We don't do anything. I didn't talk with anybody about it. I didn't talk with my folks about it. I didn't think about it. 
I didn't look in the Bible because I wasn't a Christian, and so I did nothing. And you know what happened? I got to see another abortion. And you know what? That one hurt too. But I didn't do anything again, and so I kept seeing abortions. And you know what? It hurt a little bit less every time I saw one. And you know what happened next? I got to sit down and do one. Because you see one, you do one, and you teach one, as Dr. Hill mentioned. Well, the first one that I did was kind of hard. It was like hurting again, like a hot poker. But after a while, it got to where it didn't hurt. My heart got calloused. My heart was calloused against the fact that I was a murderer. I was just simply uncommitted. And that's the way a lot of people today are. We're uncommitted. We're afraid to stand up. We're afraid to speak out. Maybe we aren't afraid. We just don't have our own convictions settled yet. I remember another experience as a resident on a hysterotomy. Well, that was kind of exciting to me to see a cesarean on a baby that young, so I helped on that surgery. And I remember as, as we made the incision and got in and made the incision in the uterus, to see the baby move underneath the sack of membranes as the cesarean incision was made, before the doctor broke the water. And the thought came to me, my God, that's a person. And then he broke the water, and when he broke the water, it was like I had a pain in my heart, just like when I saw that first suction abortion. And then he delivered the baby, and I, I couldn't touch the baby. I wasn't much of an assistant, I just stood there and, and the reality of what was going on was finally beginning to seep in to my callous brain and heart. And they simply took that little baby that was making little sounds and, and moving and kicking over and set it on the table in a cold stainless steel bowl. And every time I would look over while we were repairing the incision in the uterus and finishing the cesarean, and look, I would see that little person kicking and moving in that bowl. And it kicked and moved less and less, of course, as time went on. And I can remember going over and looking at that baby when we were done with the surgery, and the baby was still alive. You could see the chest with a moving as the heart beat. And the baby would try and take a little breath like that. And it, it really hurt inside. And it began to educate me as to what abortion really was. Now, this is how I got involved. And I want you to listen to this. Because this is how many people get involved. I began my residency in July of 1971. And on July 7th, 1971, one and a half years before Roe versus Wade, I went into the operating room where my chief resident sat down on a stool. He performed an abortion, and then he said that I could do the next one. I did not feel right about doing abortions, but I made no effort to distinguish legal from moral at that time. My justification was that it was legal, the patients wanted it done, and they came from all over the world to Travis Air Force Base in California to have it done. The patients that we cared for after injecting the hypertonic saline, we actually took to the labor and delivery unit. And it was there that I had the beginnings of what I call my emotional turmoil. It was there that I took care of these patients who had had injections of hypertonic saline solution. And it was there that I treated patients in premature labor. Now we used medications to try to stop the labor of the women in premature labor so that the pregnancy could progress to term. Sometimes the aborted babies were bigger than the premature ones which we took to the nursery. It was at this point that I began to have nightmares. Now this nightmare is a recurring nightmare and I'll share it with you. But in my nightmares I would deliver a healthy newborn baby. I would take that healthy newborn baby and I would hold it up. And I would face a jury 
of faceless people and ask them to tell me what to do with this baby. They were to go thumbs up or thumbs down, and if they made a thumbs down indication, then I was to drop the baby into a bucket of water which was present. I never did uh, reach the point of dropping the baby into the bucket because I'd always wake up at that point. But it was clear to me then that there was something going on uh, in my mind, uh, subconsciously. I actually stopped doing uh, the second trimester abortions at that time. Uh, there was no great clamor about my refusing to do the abortions, but it was interesting to me that there was a subtle understanding that my actions were causing the other residents to do more than their share. Now I'm going to stand here and tell you that I am a murderer. I have taken the lives of innocent babies and I have ripped them from their mother's wombs with a powerful vacuum instrument. And when they were too big to do it in that way, I've injected a concentrated salt solution into the bag of waters to slowly and painfully poison them and then to cause labor to follow. As I close my presentation today, it should be obvious to you that my participation in abortion was not as an avid abortion proponent, but as a reluctant puppet in a world gone berserk. Unfortunately, there are many such puppets today without the courage to admit that they're, what they're doing is wrong. And every year, there are more puppet physicians and nurses who are added to this number. I've had the opportunity to speak to groups of medical students and uh, nurses in training, and my advice to them has always been, when they're asked to provide abortion services and to get involved, they should simply say no from the beginning. Now, I wish I could stand here today and tell you that I decided to stop doing abortions in a single instant, but it didn't happen that way. As you will see, my decision was, and perhaps still is, an evolving one. A family practice doctor <laughs> told me, the, the expert, the gynecologist, that of course IUDs were, were many abortions. Uh, didn't you realize that conception takes place in the fallopian tube and implantation inside the uterus and that an IUD certainly doesn't stop uh, fertilization? And it was like, ah, oh, he's right, he's right. And I'll tell you, it was harder for me to quit putting in IUDs than it was for me to quit doing abortions. When you quit doing abortions, you know, you get a lot of pats on the back, people say, nice kid, you're cleaning up your act. You start stopping doing things like IUDs and people say, that kook over there, you know, they're getting a little far out. One thing I have done is, is made a personal commitment to not put in IUDs anymore because I believe that they cause abortion. I've made a commitment not to give out birth controls to women for contraception because there are approximately four cycles in a hundred where there will be breakthrough ovulation and fertilization can occur, but the baby can then not form because the pills have changed the lining of the uterus. And I realized finally that that is just like an IUD. There is conception. And my new definition of life is when conception occurs. So that for me is an abortion. For me to give a prescription out to a girl and allow her to take the pill. It's because you are killing them. And that's all there is to it. Abortion is murder. Murder, 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 murder.